What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for the Callisto Protocol, which should be going up the same time the game itself launches roughly, as that's when the embargo lifts, which means of course that I did get a review copy of this to play ahead of time a few days in advance, which combined with very little sleep, allowed me to 100% it. And to get my normal stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on YouTube, and while this does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that as well. If you're curious about everything that that entails and you're not subscribed, if you go to my channel, first thing you'll see is a video explaining everything that I cover. My Steam profile is also public and linked in the description below. And with this being the same day the game launches, I'm trying to keep spoilers as minimal as possible, but given the survival horror elements of this game, there might be some contextual stuff, especially in the video, so something to keep in mind. And last but not least, I am playing this on Steam, so the PC version of course, so I don't have specific information about how this runs on console, but we will double back to that a little bit later. So as I just mentioned, the Callisto Protocol is a survival horror game from the makers of Dead Space, a much beloved game in that genre. And more than that, the Callisto Protocol promises to be a next generation survival horror experience, and I think in some ways it lives up to that, and in other places stumbles a little bit, which obviously we'll get into. But what we are surviving is an outbreak in a prison colony out in space, specifically on one of Jupiter's moons, that is turning the prisoners into monsters. Now before we jump jump into the story setup, I want to talk a little bit about the difficulty and the accessibility options, as there's quite a bit to enjoy here. Now in terms of difficulty, you have minimum, medium, and maximum security, which of course just means easy, normal, and hard, and this more or less affects what you would expect it to. Enemies deal more damage and take longer to kill, though there are a variety of ways to one-shot a lot of enemies, which we'll talk about, which can help you out there. However, separate from the difficulty of the game, there are a ton of accessibility options, and I mention these because I think they can help a lot of people get into the game regardless of skill level, and these include things like aim assist, auto dodging, auto completing the QTEs, changing the QTEs to a single button press instead, and a variety of other things you can see on screen. So you have options in terms of the difficulty, this can be a relatively relaxed experience focused on the horror and the narrative, or if you're really in for a challenge, maximum security with all the accessibility options turned off is very challenging. And from here, I'd like to talk a little bit about the story setup for the game. Now, if you don't want any kind of spoiler at all, I would just skip past this completely. The brief summary I already gave you will suffice, but here I'd like to talk a little more specifically about the story setup as well as some of my thoughts on the story in general, so skip ahead if you don't want to hear it. First and foremost, the story's probably going to run you 10 to 15 hours depending on how fast you're moving, how much trouble you're having, that kind of thing, which is about what you'd expect from a game like this. And the game itself is pretty linear. You're going to be moving from chapter to chapter in a straightforward fashion, though you can save pretty much any time along the way. So if you want to re-explore stuff, that's really the way to go, as there isn't a New Game Plus option. But beyond that, as I mentioned, the story takes place in a prison colony located on Jupiter's moon. We play the role of Jacob Lee who is running some sort of transportation business to and from the prison, though there's obviously something fishy going on right at the start of the game, or we wouldn't have a game to talk about. However, during one of these missions, you wind up crash landing on the moon next to the facility. After rescuing you, you are ultimately arrested alongside a person who caused the crash. Obviously, you're then incarcerated, at which point, right after you're thrown into prison, the outbreak happens and you're forced into a survival situation, which is as much as I'm going to explain about the story overall. But here are some general thoughts. Overall, I thought it was a great narrative. It's mostly well-paced. I think there's one part towards the end that kind of drags, though to the game's credit, right when I was thinking to myself, this has gone on a little too long, it decided to wrap up and move on. The story itself has some twists and turns that I thought were pretty cool, and the game definitely definitely leaves room for a sequel as well. But the one thing that I really want to talk about with the story is the pacing itself. I think the game is very, very well paced. There really isn't any filler on top of this story. While there are parts of the missions where you can kind of explore around a little bit and take your time, the narrative is really focused, which I enjoyed. But also alongside of that, a lot of your upgrades and equipment are also well paced in a way that definitely reminds you that you have to keep an eye on your resources and your upgrades. And speaking of that, let's talk about progression a little bit. The primary form of progression in this game is your weapons. Throughout the game, you'll be picking up a variety of 
items and credits. Credits just being the currency in general. You can spin these at 3D printers to upgrade and make new weapons. You can also pick up items along the way that you can sell at these 3D printers for extra credits, which is where the bulk of your money is going to come from. Though your inventory space is limited, meaning that you'll have to decide between carrying these high value items or say extra health pop-ups. Throughout the game, you'll get a variety of weapons, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. And when it comes to progression specifically, I would say it's better for the most part to focus on the weapons you want to use, as there are a variety of weapon types, and a lot of their effectiveness largely comes down to preference and the amount of damage you want to deal in a particular instance. So because of this, I would focus your resources on the things you use the most, because if you try to spread all of your resources out a little bit, that's when resources can feel a little tight. And you're going to notice yourself running out of things quite a bit. But if you focus on just a few of them, you'll find that if anything, you have resources to spare, which can make the higher difficulties a little easier for you. In addition to those things, you can also print ammo and consumables at the 3D printer as well, though. So that's something to keep in mind. Ammo was never particularly scarce. Like for the most part, I was able to find quite a bit of it. But if you're in a situation where you're running low, it is possible to print that and your health pickups at the 3D printer as well. And while the ammo is pretty cheap, the health injectors specifically are very expensive. From there though, let's talk about combat. Now I want to lead this section off with probably my biggest criticism of the combat, and that is there is a lack of enemy variety in this game. There's really only a handful of enemy types, and you're going to be seeing a lot of them. And while combat does have a lot of good things going for it, it does get a little repetitive to see like the same five enemies over and over and over. Now, as far as combat goes, we start off fairly helpless. We don't even have a melee weapon. We have to, you know, acquire them and then you only have the melee weapon and it takes a while to get guns. And compared to these monsters that are just ripping people's arms off and things, you feel pretty helpless. A little ways into the game, though, you'll get access to a stun baton, which replaces your sort of lead pipe. This is your basic melee weapon that you're going to be using when you don't want to use up your ammo. In addition to this, we get three pistol types which basically range from low damage, fast fire rate to high damage, not a lot of ammo. Then we also get a shotgun, and then way late in the game, towards the end actually, you get an assault rifle to mess around with, which is pretty fun. And then you get my personal favorite, which is the grip. The grip is just force push and pull. It's a glove that you get that allows you to pull enemies to you and then launch them away, which will allow you to effectively one-shot kill enemies by just throwing them onto environmental hazards, which is hilarious. Easily my favorite weapon in the entire game. Overall, though, this does give you a decent amount of variety and approaches to combat, and the game is smart enough to not give you ammo for weapons you don't have yet. Ammo won't actually start dropping for weapon types unless you have them, which is important because some of the later guns you have to actually print. You don't even get them as a weapon to begin with. You have to find the schematic and then print the weapon. And until you've printed a weapon, ammo won't start dropping for it, and because of this, it's easy to focus on the ammo you need, especially if you know that ahead of time. You can just not print the weapons you're not going to use and then stock up on all the ammo. And some of the guns are insanely powerful, especially once they get maxed out. They also have alternative fire modes, some of which can one shot some of the basic enemies, which is very strong later in the game, especially if you're just focusing on the one ammo type. In addition to this, though, there's a few other things to know. You can occasionally use stealth to your advantage sneaking behind enemies. There is one section of the game that focuses on this pretty heavily. And then when you're in melee combat with something, you have the ability to dodge by holding A or D respectively. I don't know what it is on the controller, but you hold the button down and you'll dodge when that enemy takes a swing at you. However, if it does a follow-up attack, you have to press the alternate button, as failing to do so will get you hit. It's also challenging to pull this off when you're facing multiple enemies because a lot of them will attack you kind of at the same time, which makes it very difficult to dodge. Though, once you've dispatched all the enemies around you, you want to stomp their corpses by pressing space. This will both cause them to drop extra items, potentially health pickups, as well as more ammo, which is the most useful thing they drop, really. And because of this, whenever you get done with the fight, if you're low on health, it's important to stomp enemies, get the resources, and then heal up if you still need health. That said, though, everything I just mentioned to you runs into one problem that is definitely something to keep in mind, and that is the camera when you are in really close quarters. Obviously, to, you know, focus on the horror, sometimes you're going to be fighting enemies in pretty small areas, and if you get too close to a wall or something like that, the camera can be 
betray you and cause you to just be unable to see enemies or unable to get a camera position where you even know what's going on. And that's probably going to cause a few deaths that can be pretty frustrating, which definitely comes up a time or two, especially when you're in an area with enemies that can use the environment to their advantage. I'm not sure exactly what you'd call it, but enemies can sometimes traverse the environment in ways that you can't via vents and stuff. And you can see them do this, but this is especially annoying if you can't get a good camera angle on what's going on. That said though, and as I'm sure you've seen on screen, most of the combat is really fun. I enjoyed it a lot, especially the grip and throwing monsters just into fans and stuff. I thought that was a lot of fun. The guns feel great to use. The combat feels very visceral and like you're actually fighting for your life, which for a survival horror game is what you want. But unfortunately, it does kind of run up against those pain points of frustration with the camera as well as lack of enemy variety. For the most part, though, it was a lot of fun. Now let's talk a bit about gameplay, world building, and the atmosphere. So I was a huge fan of the atmosphere throughout this game. And the game itself is gorgeous, though that's probably going to be rough on a few systems, which we'll talk about next. But the world building is especially well done. Occasionally throughout the game, you'll find all sorts of audio logs. You can also find logs from deceased people, of course, that can explain more of the situation and give more intel about what's happening. And you can tell they put a lot of thought into fleshing out this world. And because of that, it's easy to get very immersed into what's happening. And in some cases, I have a lot more questions about things that don't really seem to get explained directly, but rather they kind of let you think about something they probably have an answer for, but just didn't show, which is a great way to handle world building. But what I think the game does especially well is building up tension. Obviously, there's a bunch of jump scares, things like that, that you would expect from any kind of horror game, really. But the thing the game really excels at is building up that slow tension. Because as you're moving around, you can move relatively quickly sometimes, you can sprint and stuff, but they do a great job of kind of always making you feel a little bit vulnerable. And as you're moving through these hallways and stuff that are just soaked with blood, there's body parts laying everywhere, sometimes something will be pulled off into a dark corner by presumably some manner of monster. It leads to a lot of tension and gets you on edge and ready to fight. But the key thing that they do here that I thought was really cool is that sometimes nothing attacks you. Obviously, eventually something will, but a lot of times they just build it up and they get you kind of anticipating something, but then nothing happens. So it kind of leaves you with this feeling of unease which really pulled me into the world. And it created this sense of just impending dread, which I think does a pretty good job of mostly covering up a lot more of the gamey stuff. As I've mentioned a few places throughout this review, things like knowing that enemies don't drop ammo types for weapons I have not printed yet, which allows me to take advantage of that, stomping enemies before healing, just little things like that that you kind of learn when you play a lot of games, are mostly well hidden by the way the game is presented which combined with how visually stunning this game is, does feel like a pretty next-gen experience. However, some of that does get a bit dampened by some of the technical stuff we're going to talk about. But last thing on the world building, though, is that I love the music. I don't generally talk about sound a lot in my reviews, but I think the background music or sounds, if you will, were really well done. There's not music per se, but there's a lot of just kind of eerie background noise, which allows you to sort of hear the monsters and things moving around in the background and just like snarling and stuff as you come up upon what is going to be a group of monsters. There's a lot they did with the sound design here that I thought was well done that bears a mention even if it's not something I typically go over. But I mentioned some technical issues, so what am I talking about there? Well, as you've probably seen in some of the footage up to this point, sometimes the game sort of hiccups and stutters a little bit, which is obviously pretty amazing immersion breaking. And this is where I wanted to mention that I have a very high-end PC for playing and editing video games for these videos. I have a 3080 Ti, and this game definitely made it sweat a little bit. Though, to be fair, I was on max settings. However, even lowering it a little bit, you still kind of get these hitches in the frame rate every once in a while, or you turn the game down so low that what was immersing me in the way the game looked at the higher settings kind of just stopped happening. So it was hard for me to find a good medium point, and I have a very high in GPU. Really only some of the bigger 40 series are better in this regard, which leaves me with questions about how the last-gen console releases are going to run and look, as well as concern for people with more mid-range systems, if you will. The people running the 
1000 and 2000 series of graphics cards for NVIDIA and the AMD equivalents, of course. That said, though, this game did market itself as next generation, but I would caution you, especially if you're on PC in particular, current gen consoles will probably be fine, but you might run into some performance issues because I did with a 3080 Ti. And with how this game looks, it's kind of hard to tell if that's just the game and its optimization or if I'm having GPU troubles, basically. And that brings me to Steam Deck compatibility. As this is mostly a PC channel, I like to cover Steam Deck compatibility for these things. And in this particular case, I would simply not play this on the Steam Deck. It just cannot handle the game. There's too much going on graphically. Even on the lowest possible settings, the frame rate for Steam Deck is like five. So needless to say, it's a really bad experience. Absolutely would not recommend this for Steam Deck. It will not play. The hardware just doesn't seem to be able to keep up. And if you're watching this in the future, there is DLC planned. I know there was a bit of drama around one of them and some death animations or something, but I can't really review DLC I don't have at the moment as the game is just now launching. But in the future, they are planning on adding three things that I know of, which are the Contagion Bundle, which is going to be like a new mode with permadeath and higher difficulty, lower resource drops, that kind of thing. A second DLC that is going to give you access to sort of waves of enemies. And this is the one with the animations I was talking about. And then there's going to be one more after that that apparently continues the story in some way, or at least expands it. So that's kind of what you can expect in the future of this game for DLC, though time will tell when we actually see that. And that finally brings us to our positives, negatives, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. So positive side of things, this is a fantastic overall experience. The entire package of this game is really something else. At least on my higher end PC, this game looked amazing. The combat felt really fun. I was very drawn into it. I love how they kind of hid some of the more gamey stuff, also made it feel very suspenseful and just filled me with this dread, and I just honestly couldn't put this down until I was done with it. I really enjoyed the combat as well, and let's be honest, at least on higher settings, this game looks phenomenal. And as somebody who plays a lot of older games, I think this is probably the first game I've played in a while that's actually made my PC actually put in some work. Of course, we do have a few negatives. As I mentioned, there are a variety of performance hiccups here and there, even on higher end hardware, which leaves me with questions about how this is going to perform on the last gen console what kind of issues we're going to see there, as well as people for more mid-range PCs, this might be a challenging game for you to play. But admittedly, that's just caution on my part. I don't have a lot of first-hand experience. All I know is that with my higher-end PC, I ran into some performance issues that definitely broke some of the immersion, especially when the frame rate would stutter and freeze a little bit as it was moving through things. But in addition to that, the enemy variety is very limited. It runs out of enemies to throw at you pretty quickly, and then it just gives you more powerful weapons to deal with more of them which can lead certain moments to feel a tiny bit underwhelming as a result which does kind of make it feel like the game runs out of ideas for things to throw at you towards the end. That brings us to our conclusion, and overall, the Callisto Protocol is a fantastic experience. It is relatively short, but the time I spent with it was engrossing, and I feel the game justifies its price tag. And overall, in spite of a few minor stumbles here and there, I would like more of this game. I'm looking forward to what they do with some of the DLC, the story, as well as sort of the riot mode, I guess it is, to kind of see what they add to this game because more of this would not be a bad thing. I enjoyed it a lot. So it definitely gets a buy from me. And with that, I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. The channel is growing every day. We just recently passed 100,000 subscribers, which is very exciting for me. And I cannot thank everybody enough. So I hope you stick around. But in the meantime, may you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.